Hello and welcome to this, the third of a series of short Zoom casts uh, on the life and legacy of Edward Hitchcock. This third one in the series entitled Edward Hitchcock on Science and Faith. Up until the late 1700s, Calvinism, often referred to as Orthodox Christianity, was the prevailing religious denomination in New England. Roughly the equivalent of Christian fundamentalism of today, Calvinism emphasized the personal relationship between a believer and God, repentance for one's sins, and renewal of one's heart in order to achieve salvation. The rise of Calvinism in New England was due in some measure to this man, the Reverend Jonathan Edwards of Northampton, Massachusetts. Edwards was a leader of the Great Awakening of the 1730s, in which he called on his parishioners to repent their sins, lest their souls fall into the hands of an angry God. But some of Calvinism's tenets were harsh, at least in the minds of many New Englanders, and by the late 1700s, a new brand of Protestantism was gaining ground, particularly in Massachusetts, Unitarianism. Unitarians rejected some of the fundamental principles of Calvinism, such as original sin, predestination, and the infallibility of the Holy Scriptures. Many New England ministers in those times were trained at Yale in New Haven, Connecticut. Yale had a strong Orthodox tradition, not surprisingly, as President Timothy Dwight was the grandson of Jonathan Edwards. Harvard, on the other hand, had become predominantly Unitarian, especially after the ascent of this man, Henry Ware, to the presidency of Harvard Divinity School. Orthodox Christianity was strong in Deerfield, the town where Edward Hitchcock was born and raised, until 1809. But in that year, the Deerfield Church welcomed a controversial new minister, the Reverend Samuel Willard. Willard was a Harvard graduate and a Unitarian. From that for day forward, Deerfield was dominated by Unitarianism. Edward Hitchcock's father, Justin, was a Calvinist, and the Hitchcock children were, were raised as Orthodox Christians. But eventually, young Edward's religious convictions leaned towards Unitarianism, no doubt strongly influenced by Reverend Willard and the larger Deerfield community in which he lived. But in 1816, Edward began to undergo a spiritual conversion, returning to the Calvinism of his father. The reasons for this conversion are several. For one, he was strongly affected by the death of a close friend, Jackson Dickinson. Furthermore, Edward met a young woman in Deerfield named Ora White. Miss White was a devout Orthodox Christian, and Edward was swayed by her faith, her sincerity, and no doubt, by her personal charms as well. In 1819, Hitchcock spent several months attending classes at Yale, not as an enrolled student, but informally, what we would call an auditor today. Here he sat in on lectures by these two men, geologist Benjamin Silliman and theologian Eleazar Fitch. By that time, Fitch and other Yale theologians were struggling to fend off the advances of Unitarianism in New England. They sought to explain Calvinism in ways that would make it more palatable to New England Protestants. Hitchcock listened intently to Fitch's lecture on theology. He heard Fitch expound on the proper interpretation of certain biblical passages. One such interpretation had to do with the Hebrew word yom, translated day in Genesis, as in God created heaven and earth in six days. Yom in Hebrew could mean a time period of any length, explained Fitch. Thus, six days could mean 6,000, 6 million, even 6 billion. He also heard Professor Silliman assert that the geological evidence showed that the earth was far older than the Bible would suggest. In 
when Edward returned to Deerfield in June of 1819, he seemed to have acquired a new voice and a new vocation. He became an itinerant preacher, traveling by horse and buggy nearly every Sunday morning, providing pulpit supply to congregational churches up and down the Connecticut Valley and even into Vermont and Connecticut. As you can see, he was pretty busy. In about two years, he wrote some 37 different sermons and delivered them on 108 occasions, including nine in Deerfield, 15 in Brattleboro, and some 30 sermons in Conway, a short distance west of Deerfield. Why did Edward Hitchcock preach in Conway so often in those years? Because of the increased frailty of John Emerson, who had been the pastor there for nearly half a century. In April 1821, Mr. Emerson announced his intention to partially retire and asked that a junior pastor be appointed. The name was Edward Hitchcock was immediately raised. Within days, Edward and Ora were married, Edward was ordained, and the couple moved to Conway, where Edward took up his new position. Edward Hitchcock was a forceful and inspired preacher. Fortunately, nearly 250 of his sermons have been preserved, most in the Amherst College archives, the collections of historic Deerfield, and the collections of the Pocumtuck Valley Memorial Association in Deerfield. Many of his sermons dealt with the basic tenets of Calvinism, sin, repentance, atonement, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the sovereignty of God, and the Bible as the infallible words of revelation. Many also dealt with personal morality and warnings about such sinful behavior as sloth, fornication, drunkenness, and excessive pride. Some addressed matters of social justice about which Hitchcock felt strongly, particularly slavery, mistreatment of the American Indian, opposition to war, and temperance. He preached in Conway for four years, but then he moved to Amherst College, where he was on the faculty for almost 30 years and preached almost uh, very regularly. What is striking about his sermons is how rarely Hitchcock addressed the subjects that touch on science, particularly the creation and the great flood. Only one of his surviving sermons addresses those matters at all, one entitled Noachian Deluge delivered in Conway in January 1823. Perhaps he decided after that sermon that the subject was too difficult for his parishioners. But just eight months later in Pittsfield, at the first meeting of a new organization, the Lyceum of Natural History, Reverend Hitchcock presented a sermon, he called it a discourse, to a distinguished group of scientists and doctors. In that discourse, he argued that geology uh, of that time confirmed the biblical account. Here, for the first time, he presented the argument about the Hebrew word yom that he had first heard at Yale. At the time, he believed that there was ample evidence to confirm the biblical account of the great flood. He said, we have proof of it all around us in our everyday excursions. Whence came these numerous worn and rounded masses of stone which are scattered over the tops of our highest hills and mountains? Surely no river could have conveyed them thither. Nothing will account for their situation but a universal deluge. Let the unbeliever then remember that as he passes over our hills, the very stones cry out against him. Well, those very stones did cry out loudly to Edward Hitchcock a few years later, but they would lead him to quite different conclusions. In 1830, Hitchcock was appointed as the first state geologist of Massachusetts. He began a survey of the state's mineral resources, the main goal of which was economic. Like most scientists of his time, Hitchcock saw much of the surface geology he observed as diluvial, that is a result of a flood, in particular the great flood of Genesis. But during his survey, he began to doubt that any flood could be responsible for what he observed. Two phenomena in particular struck his interest throughout Massachusetts and New England, diluvial grooves, what we would call glacial striae today, and large boulders far from their source, what we call glacial erratics. He found those boulders particularly interesting and perplexing. 
For one thing, many were huge, like this one in Whitingham, Vermont, that he named the Green Mountain Giant. I visited that very boulder not long ago, and as you can see, it is massive. He was further perplexed in the Berkshires by many trains of boulders such as these that stretched across Richmond and Stockbridge. This train, shown by the red dot, consisted of hundreds, perhaps thousands of large boulders um, that were just stretched across um, Richmond and Stockbridge. The train consisted of hundreds, perhaps thousands of large boulders that originated on a ridge in New York State. He wrote in his report in 1833, making every allowance for the reduction of the gravity of these boulders when in water. I confess I cannot conceive how such a work could have been effected by this agency. Evidence of this sort caused Hitchcock to doubt that any flood, no matter how great, could have been the cause of those boulders and those glacial furrows. Just a few years later, Louis Agassiz published his landmark work on continental glaciation. And when he did, Edward Hitchcock was among the first American geologists to publicly adopt that theory. From 1835 to 1837, Hitchcock published a series of articles in the Biblical Repository, an influential theological journal on the subject of geology and uh, religion. Here he returned to the theme of his utility speech in Pittsfield a decade earlier, arguing that the differences between science and religion were minor and readily explained. To Hitchcock, the supposed conflict between geology and the words of Revelation amounted to little more than a question of con chronology. There was no real conflict, he asserted, not when one carefully examined the geological evidence. God did create heaven and earth in six days, but days not in the strict 24 hour sense. God did populate the earth with organic beings and God did create man after all other creatures. He wrote, those objections which have been derived from the science to the truth of the scriptures have one after another vanished away just so soon as patient investigation had thrown the clear light of truth upon the subject. In 1836, this man, the Reverend Moses Stewart of Andover Theological School published a response to Hitchcock. Stewart had no argument with geology. It mattered not to religion what geologists found, he believed, because the Bible was never intended to be understood as a scientific document. It taught religious truths, not scientific truths. To Reverend Stewart, science and religion were independent, while Hitchcock saw them as intimately linked. Stewart wrote, inspiration is concerned with teaching religious truths, and such facts or occurrences that are connected immediately with understanding them or with impressing them on the mind. This is the object and extent of it, and to assume or suppose that it goes beyond this is assigning a place to it, which it was never designed to fill. Edward Hitchcock's greatest ambition in life was to convince his fellow scientists, clergymen, and the general public that science and faith need not be antagonistic, that science should not be regarded as the enemy of religion. He wrote several dozens of scholarly papers on the subject in his life, but in 1851, he published what he regarded as his most important work, a book entitled The Religion of Geology and Its Interconnected Sciences. In that work, he tried to demonstrate the unity of all knowledge and asserted that the hostility between science and revelation, we believe, is only apparent, not real. When rightly interpreted and understood, they will appear in perfect unison. How did Hitchcock reconcile those conflicts between Holy Scripture and the findings of modern one, uh, science? For one thing, he argued for a thoughtful in formed interpretation of the Bible, as in the proper understanding of the Hebrew word for day. Furthermore, he asserted that the Bible was not written by scientists or meant to be a scientific document, but rather a book of faith. In this, he somewhat echoed the words of Moses Stewart. 
Finally, Hitchcock argued again and again that the human mind is not capable of understanding everything in God's creation. If you are perplexed about an apparent contradiction be science, between science and your religious beliefs, wait, he advised, one day all will be explained to you, one day in heaven. Well, the clash between science and religion came to a dramatic crescendo in the last few years of Hitchcock's life with the publication of Darwin's On the Origin of Species. At first, Hitchcock argued strenuously against Darwinism on a number of religious points. But if you read his papers carefully in the last few years of his life, you see his thinking about Darwinism begin to pivot. In a paper published just a year before his death in the journal Bibliotheca Sacra, he wrote, but after all, the real question is not whether these hypotheses accord with our religious views, but whether they are true. Then he wrote these tantalizing last words on the subject. The, the fact that these new creations are repeated at intervals and seem to form a part of a series of operations, which we know to be natural, makes it quite probable that they also are natural. Perhaps this unknown law, that is natural selection or evolution, uh, will by and by be discovered as many new laws have been to explain phenomena once supposed to be miraculous because anomalous and inexplicable. In other words, he was willing to keep the door open, to keep his mind open on the subject of evolution. Possibly, just possibly, the transmutation of species, natural selection, even human evolution were all part of God's plan. Some historians have labeled Edward Hitchcock as one of the last of the Christian geologists. But if by that term is meant someone who allows religion to intrude upon and influence science, then I believe it is not a fair assessment of Edward Hitchcock. For he found his own way of bridging the gap between science and faith. Far from being the last of a dying breed, he might well have been one of the first of a new breed of scientists that were comfortable with a world created by God, but regulated by the laws and principles of nature. There's a story told by one of Hitchcock's students that late in life, when he was starting a new term with one of his geology classes, the class met for the first time in a renovated building with a new skylight that brought light into a room that was previously dark. On the first day, Professor Hitchcock stood before his students, looking up at the light streaming into the room, smiled, and said the following, which I think is a perfect summary of his fundamental position. Young gentlemen, all the light we have here comes from above. For many more insights into Edward Hitchcock, and I invite you to read my book, All the Light Here Comes From Above, The Life and Legacy of Edward Hitchcock. You might also enjoy visiting my website, www.edwardhitchcock.com for additional information on the book and on the man. Thank you very much for joining me today.